uh, good morning, everybody. Hope uh, you're well. Chodesh uh, Tov. You know, Chazal tell us. Uh, unfortunately, I don't have the uh, headphone today, so I'll try to talk a little louder. Uh, the uh, Gemara tells us, Benisan Nigalo, that we were redeemed in the month of Nisan. Ubenisan Asidin Ligoyal, and the future redemption will occur in the month of Nisan. Now, of course, Mashiach can come any time. But Nisan is the most probable. Nisan is Mesugal, to be the month of, of Geula. Every Nisan, we of course hope that that'll be the month of Geula. Uh, obviously at a time when uh, Am Yisrael is still undergoing a difficult uh, tsara, a mulchama that is going on, uh, hostages who still have not been uh, released, uh, certainly uh, we, we yearn even more that this should be a month of Geula and Yeshua, Uh, May we see the Geula of Yisrael, Shalom al Yisrael, and ultimately the coming of Mashiach in the the world. Um, I want to talk about, it's very, very interesting, you know, there's a lot of things that we may have learned, you know, in first grade, kindergarten, things that we've heard all of our lives. And yet, as you get older, you begin to think about them, and some things don't make sense, even though we were taught this all of our lives. And I want to discuss a little bit the story of matzah. I know you want chametz. I'll, I'll get to chametz too eventually. Uh, uh, but why why do we eat matzah? So it's clear from the Haggadah itself, and really from the Torah itself in Parshas Riei, that there are two different reasons why we eat matzah. Matzah is a symbol that commemorates two things. One is matzah is called lechem oni, the bread of affliction the bread of poverty, the bread of suffering. Uh, It was the food that slaves were commonly fed. And the Ebenezer himself writes that he visited India and he saw the Maharajis giving their slaves matzah or unleavened unleavened bread because it's heavy and it sticks in your stomach a very long time. And as a result, you don't have to be fed that often. So matzah, some type of unleavened bread, was the common food of the slave. So the same way when I eat maror, I remember the bitterness of slavery. Matzah is a commemoration of the slavery. That's one reason, and that's lechem oni. There is another reason, that it is connected to chipazon. It was connected by the hurriedness that we were, we were kicked out of Mitzrayim. That's what I'm going to talk about in more, in more length in a, in a moment. We were kicked out of Mitzrayim. We didn't have time to let our dough rise. So matzah commemorates geula. So matzah is a complicated symbol. Maror represents totally slavery. That's it. The four cups of wine is redemption and freedom. Matzah is a little complicated because matzah is both a slavery symbol and a redemption symbol. And indeed, this is highlighted in the Haggadah where the matzah is discussed two different places. In the beginning of the Seder, we point to the matzah and we say, Ha lachma anya, the Aramaic, because this was written after the Chorban. This is the bread of poverty, the bread of affliction. Lechemoni is, is Aramaic, lachma anya, that our forefathers ate in Egypt. What do we mean our forefathers ate in Egypt? When they were slaves. And yet, at the end of the Magid, we quote Rabban Gamliel, and he says, anyone that does not explain the three mitzvos of Pesach, Matzah, Moror, has not even yotze his mitzvah, or her mitzvah. And when it explains matzah, it talks about, lo hispik, bitseikam, shelavoseinu lahachmitz. There was not enough time for the dough to rise and become leavened. So the Haggadah begins with the matzah of slavery, and the Magid ends with the matzah of freedom, which is actually very, very good, because the whole adada is the transition of avdut lechayrut. And therefore, the idea is, matzah is a double symbol. By the way, just as a little aside, the Abarbanel, who wrote, who wrote, uh, Abarbanel wrote many, many commentaries on Tanakh, on Chomish, Nevi'im, and some Ksuvim. He also wrote a voluminous parish on the Haggadah, as well as Pirkei Avos. So on the Haggadah, you know the Abarbanel's general shita, and this is throughout all of his commentaries, is he will take a certain section and ask many, many, many questions, sometimes 
20, 30, 40, 50, 100. And then he'll give a shot that will answer all of the questions. So there's an old joke that a person became an apicoris by reading a Barbanel because he used to love to read the Barbanel's commentary after lunch on Shabbos, after he had his cholent. So he would sit in his easy chair. He would read 100 kashas on the Torah and he fell asleep before he read the answer. So he says, oh, so many kashas, contradictions, inconsistencies. Right, so it's a little dangerous to have so many kashas. But in his parish on the Haggadah, he actually does that. He is makdim 100 kashas on the Haggadah, and then he explains it. But in the Manishtan, I just want to share a little word with you. Just uh, the Manishtan, he says a very interesting thing. He says that the kid that's asking the Manishtana, first of all, it's a strange thing. He must be a smart kid because he knows things we haven't done yet. In other words, Mimanovshek, <laughs> he knows the Seder because we haven't dipped twice. So, if he knows what we're going to do, why doesn't he remember the answer? Like, it's a kind of a selective memory, exactly. Uh, what type of kid are we talking about? But the Barbanel says that the kid is asking a conceptual kasha. He's asking his parents, what is it that we're celebrating the Seder night? Are we remembering slavery? Or are we celebrating freedom? Because we do both things. The first one is, uh, we eat matzah. So matzah is both slavery and freedom. The second question is, we eat bitter herbs, which is uh, slavery. The third is, we dip twice, which is a luxury of freedom. And the fourth is, we recline, which is also an expression of luxury and freedom. So what is it? We have some signs of slavery, some signs of freedom. Which is it? So the Rabbanel says... The four words after Manishtana, of, or the five words, Avodim Hayinu Leparo Vimitzrayim. Those are four words. Vyotzieinu Hashem Elokein and God took us out. That's the answer. You're asking, are we doing slavery or freedom? The answer is we're doing both. We were slaves and Hashem took us out. In other words, because people ask the question, that's another question people ask, that there is never an explicit answer to the four questions. Yeah, of course, you can tease it out from the whole narrative. But there's never really an answer, meaning the kid asks four questions, and we don't really answer the four questions. The answer to the first question is this, second question is this. We give a whole story out of which you could figure things out. But the Rabbanel says, Avodim hayinu Mitzrayim That one sentence is the answer to the Manishtana. Because the kid is not simply asking, about the particular rituals, he's asking if the Seder is about Avdutz or the Seder is about Cheirutz, and the answer is, it is about both. Okay, so be it as it may, when it comes to matzah, though, matzah is a dual symbol. One is Lechem Oni, and the other is Lo Hispik Bitsekam Shel Avoseinu Lahachmitz. There was no time. Okay. So here is the problem. Here is the big problem. In Shmos Perek Yud Beis, which was given Rosh Chodesh Nisan, two weeks before Yitzhiyat Mitzrayim, 15 days before Yitzhiyat Mitzrayim, we read it in the Mafter this past week, it was Parshas HaChodesh. Hashem gives Moshe a lot of laws about the holiday of Pesach, about the Korban Pesach and the like. Remember, these laws are given two weeks before the Exodus. Among those laws are, for seven days you're not allowed to eat chametz, you must eat matzah, you're not even allowed to own chametz. That means two weeks before the Exodus, we were already given a commandment not to eat chametz, to eat matzah, at least the first night, and not to own chametz. And indeed, when we had our first Seder, right, our first Seder was on the, uh, the night of the 15th. We brought the Korban Pesach on the 14th. We ate matzah. Al matzos, umarorim, yochluo. You have to eat matzah and morer. So they actually ate matzah the night before they left Mitzrayim. So here's the problem. How can you say that the reason why we eat matzah is to commemorate the chipazon by which we had to leave Mitzrayim. 
we were already told not to eat chametz and to eat matzah two weeks before. Now, I want to point out, this question is a little stronger than you might, you might make it. The question is not... You could, you could ask the question in two ways, and one way is not so difficult. The question is, well, how could this be the reason if the mitzvah was given before? That's one way of asking the question. How could a reason for a mitzvah be something that didn't arise till later? That actually is one way people ask the question. That's not so difficult. God gave a mitzvah in advance of the reason that would materialize later. In other words, that doesn't bother me so much. Avram ate matzah, you know, etc. But what bothers me is this. The fact that the commandment was given before means the whole reason doesn't apply anymore. Because well, what are you telling me? You're telling me in the morning they have to bake bread. And they didn't have time to let their dough rise because the Egyptians said, or Hashem said, you got to leave now. What do you mean? Even if the Egyptians or even God would have said, ah, you have the whole day. We still wouldn't have been allowed to bake chametz because we were commanded two weeks before not to have chametz. In other words, the reason self-destructs. It's not just God gave a mitzvah before we knew the reason. That, that actually is not such a big question. God can give you many mitzvahs and you'll discover the reason later. The question is a much more difficult question. And that is, in light of the fact that we were already prohibited, not only from eating chametz, but from me even owning chametz, we read, we read that yesterday, then by the time we're baking our bread the morning of the 15th, we're not allowed to bake chametz. So how does chametz show, how does the lack of chametz show we left Egypt in a hurry? It has nothing to do with leaving Egypt, because even if, it has nothing to do with leaving Egypt in a hurry, because even if we didn't have to leave it in a hurry, we would have to bake it as matzah and not as chametz. So the whole reason of chipazon becomes a self-destroyed reason because we already were prohibited from eating, well, not just eating chametz, but from owning chametz, having chametz already, and that was a prohibition that was given Rosh Chodesh Nisan, two weeks, 15 days before Pesach. It's a tremendously uh, good kasha, meaning how is it shayach, the whole uh, reason of lo hispik, but say come shall avoseinu lahachmitz. Even if they would have had the time, they couldn't have done it. So there are two answers to this. Uh, answer number actually, both of them are unfortunately quite complicated. Um, I'll start with the lesser of the two complicated answers, but both are complicated. Uh, answer number one is given by the Ran Rabbeinu Nisim, one of the great Rishonim who lived in Spain in the 1400s. Uh, by the way, he not only wrote great commentaries on, on Gomorrah and on the Rif, he also wrote a, one of the greatest uh, small books on Jewish philosophy called Jerusha Saran. Art Scroll recently translated it and the like. Uh, so he was also a very, very great uh, philosopher as well as a physician. So in those days, uh, we were less stratified. People were able to be Gedolei Torah and physicians <laughs> and everything else in between. The Rashba, by the way, was a banker. So, you know, people had uh, different different types of professions. Um, okay, this is what the Ran says. The Ran points out that there is a difference between Pesach Mitzrayim, meaning the first Pesach that was observed in Egypt, that one Pesach, right, that first Pesach, and Pesach Dorot, Pesach as it would be observed from then on. And he points out, and he has, and I'll show you a proof from the Psukim themselves. Pesach Mitzrayim, the Easter of Chametz, was only the first day. Meaning in Mitzrayim, that first Pesach, well, including when they left, but that first year, the Easter of Chametz was only Yom Echad, number one. Number two, the Isser was only eating, the Isser was not owning. In other words, the Ran posits, again, he brings proofs to this, and I'll actually I'll show you a textual proof of this. The Ran posits, there were two distinctions between Pesach Mitzrayim and Pesach Dorot. 
Distinction number one is Pesach Mitzrayim, the Easter of eating chametz, was only on the 15th of, you know, Erev Pesach and the 15th of Nisan. It did not apply from the 16th onward. Number two, even on the 15th, they were allowed to own chametz. In other words, the Isra of Bal Yei or Bal Yei Matzei did not kick in until the next year. So based on these two reasonings, we can now understand the story, the Ran says. The Jewish people get up after Makas Bechoros, after that whole night. I'm not sure if anybody slept, actually. But in the morning, they want to bake their bread. Now, the truth of the matter is, the cloud is a difficult question. What do you mean they didn't have time to let their dough rise? When, when did the Jews leave Mitzrayim? They didn't leave Mitzrayim at the crack of dawn. They left at high noon. So why didn't they have time to bake their bread? They could have baked their bread uh, from 7 a.m. You know, to, to noon. Bechlal, that's a whole kasha. But the answer is, you know, uh, everybody thinks they have more time than... <laughs> meaning, it, it wasn't intrinsically a rush, but Lamaisa, people were baking their bread the last minute, not realizing there wouldn't be a last minute. So here's the thing Duran says. It is true that the night before they already ate matzah at the Seder. And it is true that on that day they're not allowed to eat chametz. But they would have been allowed to bake chametz because you're allowed to own chametz on the 15th and they could bake the chametz to be eaten the next day. And therefore, here's what the Ran says, had they been given time to let their dough rise, they would have baked bread on the 15th of Nisan, not to eat on that day, but to eat the next day. However, they didn't have time to let their dough rise, so it had to be matzah. So because of that, God commanded Lidorot that we don't eat the chametz for all seven days, and we don't, um, we don't own chametz uh, even on the first day starting from the first day. Okay, so that's what the Ran says. So the Ran says the idea that had they had time to let their dough rise, they would have baked bread on the 15th. They wouldn't have been allowed to eat it, but they would have been allowed to hold it to eat the next day. But because they didn't have time to let their dough rise, Hashem was koveya, that there's an issue of seven days. Now, the question you might ask me is, well, wait a second here. If I go back to Parsha Tachodesh, which was given Rosh Chodesh Nisan, it does say Beferish, don't eat chametz for seven days and don't own chametz. Meaning, that didn't come later. That was built into the original Parsha itself. So if you look, um, I don't have a, let's see if I have a, I don't know if I have a chumash here. Well, okay, uh, I don't remember the exact wording, but, but if you look at the Chumash, it's very, very clear. If you read it very, very carefully, uh, it talks about, you know, you have to eat matzah the night of Pesach, you know, etc. And then it says, and when you come into the land later, you shall not have chametz for seven days. Which means, it's very, very clear that the seven, anything to do with the seven days it was not connected to Pesach Mitzrayim. Which actually means... When the Jewish people first hear this mitzvah, they don't know the meaning of it, meaning the following. When they are told that when you get to the land or the desert, oh, that's also a little bit of a problem, you are not allowed to own chametz and you cannot eat chametz for seven days, they don't yet know, you see, they don't yet know the reason for that. The reason for that is going to be nitzkaleh, only the next morning when it's loy hispik betsekem lahachmetz. So yes, the seven-day mitzvah, they were told, is not going to be operative till a later time, but they don't know the reason why it's going to become operative at a later time. They didn't know the reason until the next morning when they realize, ah, loy hispik betsekem shel avosenu very good. So, so I'll, I'll come back to that. Yeah, that's that's a good question. 
Okay? So this is how the Ran understands the story. So it's a lot more complicated than what we might have heard, you know, when we were, when we were children. Uh, because in point of fact, they weren't allowed to eat bread on that first day, but they would have been allowed to bake the bread and save it for the next day. But because we didn't have time to let it rise, Hashem then said, we will commemorate that for that seven-day seven day period. Which means, so now let's ask this question. So that first Seder when they ate matzah, that first Seder when they ate matzah, what was the symbolic significance of their eating the matzah that first night since the Misa of Lahispik Pitsekem Shalabhaseinu Lahakmetz did not occur until the next day? The answer is Pesach Mitzrayim, matzah only had a single symbolic value. It was Lechem Oni. In other words, matzah acquired a dual symbolism only starting in year two. In year one, it only had the symbolism of Lechem Oni. Now, this is very, very interesting because this actually has some halachic, practical halachic ramifications. Let me talk a little bit. I'm not sure I, I'm not sure if I talked about it last week, so forgive me if I'm repeating a little bit. Let me talk a little briefly about egg matzah a little, right? There's a very popular product uh, in the market uh, called egg matzah, a matzah that's made with egg yolk, with chocolate, with fruit juice, with honey, all sorts of different things. And uh, the Hebrew halachic term for this type of product is called matzah ashira. Again, that's an opposite of lechemoni. Matzah has to be poor man's bread, unadorned with any type of flavorings. But when you add flavoring, you add uh, egg yolk and honey and chocolate and fruit juice, that's called matzah ashira. Now, the one halacha that everybody agrees to without, without any machlokas is you cannot use matzah ashira for the seder matzah. The mitzvah of matzah cannot be uh, mekuyam through matzah ashira. That's no machlokas whatsoever. And the reason is because the Torah describes the matzah mitzvah as lechem oni. The big shaila is, okay, I can't use egg matzah at the Seder, but can I eat egg matzah during Pesach? You know, during Pesach. So here you have a big machlokas, Ashkenazim and Svardim. So kidneys is not only, is not the only area of machlokas. Svardim, really Rav Yosef Kaira, the machabra, again, this is a big sugi in the Gemara, so I'm not giving you all the background, but just to give you the bottom line. Uh, the machabra paskins, egg matzah is not chametz, egg matzah is matzah. It's not lechem oni, so I can't use it at the Seder, but egg matzah is a perfectly acceptable product during Pesach, so I can eat egg matzah, matzah ashira during Pesach, no problem. And by the way, many Ashkenazic poskim uh, before the Ramah agreed to that. The Maral of Prague, who was an older contemporary of Ramah, specifically says there is no problem with egg matzah whatsoever, and Tosos and Psachim is mashed with the same way. But the Ramah, which Ashkenazim follow, bring a Chumrah that our Minhag is, the Minhag of Ashkenazim, although there are many Ashkenazim who are cholak on him, is we don't eat egg matzah at all during Pesach because we are afraid of a Chumrah that when you mix fruit juice or egg yolk with water, Perhaps that accelerates the chametz process, meaning chametz normally is 18 minutes, so you make matzah under 18 minutes and you're okay, but maybe this is a chumrah mamaher lahachmitz, so our minog is not to eat it, but this is a very inconsistent minog, because you're allowed to own it, if it would be chametz you wouldn't be allowed to own it, and you can give it to a chola, a sick person who's unable to chew very well, because egg matzah is softer, not for the Seder, but, but for other, other and uh, a cotton. So it's an inconsistent chumrah. I don't eat it because maybe it's chametz. On the other hand, uh, I can keep it in the house and, and I can give it to kids. So this was a very interesting little story in the annals of American hashkachos. You know, when you used to have the big old matzah companies, I think most of them are not around anymore. Harwitz, Margaretten, I think Manischewitz is still around, but whatever. Uh, so when they, ma- when they made egg matzah, Many of them, on one hand, you're not supposed to eat it if you're Ashkenazi, but they don't want to put on the package, don't eat it. So, so they, put, they put in Hebrew 
Ayin in Hebrew, Hebrew Hebrew letters, Hebrew words. Ayin Shulchan Aruch Simin Tuf Ayin Aleph. Now, most people who didn't know just assumed that was another heksher. Uh, they certainly weren't going to look up the Shulchan Aruch and the Ramah, but I actually don't eat this. So Rav Aaron Soloveitchik, Zichrona Levracha, who was the Rav Hamachshir of Streitz, he said Gneva Stas, this is deceptive, and he was the one who started. He demanded that they put in English. Uh, conspicuous English, like his pack of cigarettes. This product can only be eaten by the elderly, by by children, and should not be eaten by healthy Ashkenazi Jews or whatever, whatever it would be. So he was the one who insisted, and I think since then, I think maybe they start they start doing it. But this is matzah shira. Now, as I say, this is a chumrah of the Ramah, which we follow because if you're, I mean, if we're Ashkenazi, we follow it. But I do want to note. There were many, many great Ashkenazi poskim who agreed with the Sephardim that there is no problem with egg uh, matzah, and I included Maral, and even much earlier than Maral, um, it seems to be clear from Rabbeinu Tam, uh, Rashi's grandson, that matzah shira would be would be mutter even on Pesach itself. Okay, so now, just... y- yeah. On the first night, do you need symbolism of poverty when you're still poor? In other words, <laughs> what, what was it simple for? Oh, in other words, because they were because they were slaves. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, it's a good point, uh, but I think the idea is they are slaves, although they stopped working Rosh Hashanah before, right? So they weren't totally slaves. But I think uh, the idea is just like eating mora, right? Mora for sure is a symbol of slavery. That Hashem is telling you that even though you're being redeemed, always remember that you were slaves, meaning it's kind of a reminder, don't turn your back on your past. This is a very important point. Remember, um, this is more of a general point, uh, when the Torah talks about uh, having compassion for the gear, for the stranger, people who are vulnerable, people who are without power, people who are without protexia, people without connections, the Torah always connects it because you were uh, slaves, you were strangers in Egypt. So in a sense, it's a very important message. Don't turn your back on the suffering that you endured. Even though you're leaving it, remember it always. So, so there is a certain meaningfulness in remembering that in the sense that you want it to be emblazoned in your, in your consciousness. Uh-huh. Uh, yeah. So uh, even on, I'm sorry. Yeah. on the first night, they eat matzah as yeah. slaves. Yeah. But they eat it precisely because Hashem said so. Yes. So there is a grain of freedom there already. We listen to Hashem. Okay, all right, that, that's true, that's true. But but all I'm saying is it wouldn't be connected to the dough couldn't rise, that's all, it didn't happen yet. Yeah. Is Yemenite matzo, which is soft, considered matzo or... Okay, a- a- absolutely not. In other words, as long as... Uh, this is the question of soft matzo. As long as the only ingredients are flour and water, whether it's hard or whether it's soft, that is called lechemoni. So Yemenite matzah is lechemoni. And indeed, in all probability, I don't know for sure, that may have been the actual matzah that the Jewish people ate in Mitzrayim. Uh, so so this, this, is a, this is a big, again, this is a big, big machlokas. So Herschel Schechter uh, takes the very sensible position. Why not? I mean, Ashkenazim and Sephardim obey the same laws of chametz other than matzah shira. And this is not matzah shira. So if it's a reliable Sephardi hashkacha on matzah, why not? So Herschel Schechter held that the soft matzah is perfectly okay. Others say, you know, Ashkenazim don't have that Masora, We don't have that tradition. So, I mean, not that my psak makes a difference. I mean, I, I would, I would, someone would ask me, I would say, it's, okay, it's fine. I don't see any problem with it. But there are those who are very <laughs> makvid on the, on the Masorah. In fact, the same thing is true with any, any what you might call non-conventional matzah. Uh, oat matzah, uh, spelt matzah, different things. Rye matzah, I don't know if there is rye matzah. All of them are kosher, obviously. But some say, we don't have a Masorah. Our Masorah is wheat. And therefore, we don't go beyond, uh, we don't go beyond wheat. So, there are more traditional, and there's more looking at it in terms of the overlying halachic concept. Okay, so everyone understands the Ron's idea. Now, 
I am sorry. Uh, did you want to? Say? Yeah. So, I would have thought that, except for the vegan, that everybody else would not be eating bread, would be eating not so generally. Not I'm sorry, say again? I didn't hear you. I would have thought, is it for being slaves? Yes. Each at that point, except for maybe not Right, slaves, right. That they would not be in the habit of eating bread. Yeah, that's that's correct. Meaning that's what the uh, that's the lechemoni because the slaves generally ate matzah. So what what God is commanding is the night of your freedom, you must still remember your slavery. That that's the, that that would be the idea. Yeah. Making bread for the next day. Oh no no that that actually fits very well because if bread is the food of freedom, it actually makes sense that hey now we're going to make bread. I mean that actually fits very very well. We were in the habit of matzah. Now it's a new life, so that that I think that fits very well. Why they would want, but Dafka want to make bread. <laughs> well, you know, I don't know. They 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 went online and looked at that. <laughs> yeah. Um, okay. All righty. So this is the round. A very very interesting. Now, now let me share with you an, an interesting ha'ora of Rav Yaakov Kamenetsky, based on this on this idea. You know, uh, even though the Torah says, Shivat Yamim Matzos Tochelu, you shall eat matzah for seven days. That, that's what the Chumash says. But we know Chazal's interpretation that the Chiyuv of eating matzah, the obligation of eating matzah, is only the first night. That's another puzzle. Be Erev Tochu Matzos. And the Shivas Yamim Matzos Tochelu is really a negative about chametz, meaning you are permitted to eat matzah for seven days, but not chametz. In other words, it's not a mitzvah say to eat matzah. It's simply an implication of the negative uh, prohibition of chametz. Right? So this is the common idea that first night is an obligation. The rest of Pesach, uh, other than Sudas Yamta, for putting that aside, if you want to have matzah, have matzah. If you don't want to have matzah, you don't have to have matzah. A lot of people don't eat matzah uh, the rest of Pesach. Actually, some, some of them for halachic reasons. Some are afraid. If you're machmer on Gebrax, so some people have a super chumrah on top of Gebrax. I mean, Gebrax is matzah that comes in contact with liquid. They say, I'm not going to eat dry matzah because maybe it'll come in contact with liquid. So there actually is a chumrah on top of Gebrax. Not to eat any matzah. They say the Beisalevi, the Beisalevi taka, did not eat any matzah beyond the kazesim of the, of the Seder itself. Okay. But there is a sheet of the Vilna Gon, very interesting sheet. The Vilna Gon says that there is in fact a mitzvah a mitzvah to eat matzah every single day of Pesach. And because ein mikra yotze midei pshuto, we do not violate the simple meaning of the verse. The verse says, shivat yamim tochal matzot. But the Gra says, it is what we call a mitzvah ki yumit, and not a mitzvah chiyuvit. Okay, what is the uh, terminology here? A mitzvah chiyuvit is a mitzvah you must do. And if you don't do it, it's a sin in God's eyes. A mitzvah chiyumit is a something, if I do it, Hashem will reward me for a good thing. But if I don't do it, I'm not going to get punished. It's not an obligation. Um, Rav Moshe says, for example, although this is a big, big chiddush, I don't want to get into it. Everyone knows the Ramban's shita that living in Eretz Yisrael is a mitzvah do raisa. Uh, we know that's the Ramban's opinion. Rav Moshe wants to say it's a mitzvah kiyumit, but not chiyuvit. But the Emma says that's a very, very minority opinion. Um, Virtually everybody understands the Ramban that it's chiyuvit. Okay, but that's Yishuv Eretz Yisrael. But eating matzah. So, the first night of Pesach, eating matzah is chiyuvi. The rest of Pesach, the Vilna Gaon says, it's kiyumit. It's kiyumit. Right, so this is the Vilna Gaon. Now, because it's kiyumit and not chiyuvit, we do not make a bracha on it. Because when do I make a bracha on a mitzvah? Only when it's Asher Kiddishanu B'mitzvosav Vitzivanu. When Hashem has commanded me, then I make a bracha. 
But if something is a good deed, which is meritorious, but it's not an obligation, you don't make a bracha. So those who are machmer like the Vilna Gaon will try to eat at least a kezayat of matzah, actually it would be shmur matzah, every day of Pesach. Now, this is the Vilna Gaon. So now let me share with you the Chiddush of Rav Yaakov Kamenetsky. It's a very, very fascinating Chiddush. Rav Yaakov Kamenetsky wants to say that the meaning of matzah, the first night of Pesach, is different than the meaning of matzah, the other days of Pesach. Because the first night of Pesach, we were given that mitzvah even before the dough not rising. So as I said before, that means the tachlit of eating matzah at the Seder initially was only because of lechem oni. And even though in year two we have the additional symbolism added, but the original imprinting of the mitzvah with its association with the bread of poverty and slavery remains. And that is why you cannot use at the Seder matzah ashira. Because matzah ashira is bedafka, not the bread of slaves. It's the bread of wealthy people that can incorporate all of these fancy ingredients in the matzah. But, says Rav Yaakov, the prohibition of chametz the rest of the week and the mitzvah of eating matzah the rest of the week would not be because of lechemoni. It would only be, be to commemorate the chipazon that we didn't have time to let our dough rise. So says Rav Yaakov Kamenetsky, Matzah Hashira is just as good a commemoration as regular matzah. Because here's the point. Bread is, matzah is unleavened because you didn't let the dough rise. So when I eat something unleavened, I'm commemorating the haste by which we left Mitzrayim. Now that particular thing can be equally fulfilled with egg matzah. Egg matzah also didn't rise and become chametz. So, egg matzah at the Seder is not good because it's not lechemoni. Now again, Rav Yaakov is, is, this does not work like the Ramah. Like the Ramah, you can't eat egg matzah at all. But, but let's put aside the Ramah's chumr. Let's just look at the Iker Hadin that egg matzah could be eaten the rest of Pesach as Fardim do, as the Maral says, as Tosvo says, and the like. So Rav Yaakov's Chiddush is the mitzvah ki yumit of matzah the rest of the week can in fact be fulfilled even by matzah ashira because the symbolic meaning of matzah during the week is exclusively lohispik betzekam shalavoseinu lahachmitz and lechem oni is the motif only for Leil Seder, which preceded the Lehistrik Patsekam Shilavasainu Lahakas. Now, as I say, this is a very, very fascinating Chiddush, uh, but for a regular Ashkenazi, it's not Nogel Lamaisa, because the Ramaz Psak is we don't eat egg matzah during the week. Right? But, but in theory, if you followed the Psak that egg matzah is permitted during the week, you could fulfill the mitzvah ki yumit even with matzah, matzah hashira. Of course, I think there's another problem, though, and you're going to have to get a special order of egg matzah, because the mitzvah of matzah is fulfilled. This is why we have shemura, only if it was specifically made for the mitzvah. I mean, kosher le Pesach matzah, which is not chametz, is not kosher for the seder, because it wasn't done the shame mitzvah. So here's the dilemma I think Rabbi Yaakov has: even if you're going to say egg matzah is valid for the mitzvah kiyumit of matzah, that's only if the egg matzah was made l'shem matzah So you're going to have to have shmura. It's a new, a new business niche. Uh, shmura egg matzah for those who want to, for those svardim who want to follow the Vilna Gaon's inyan. <laughs> it's already some unusual mix. For those svardim who want to follow the Vilna Gaon's inyan of a mitzvah kiyumit of achilat matzah, we can have shmura matzah l'shem 
uh, l'shem mitzvah. Again, fascinating. But again, it's very it's a very logical construct because the seder matzah is lechemoni plus the other idea. The matzah during the week is to commemorate the chipazon of Mitzrayim. On the chipazon, he says, egg matzah is just as good as regular matzah. It didn't rise. It reminds us of the haste by which we had to leave leave Mitzrayim. Now, I want to mention, though, that Maharal of Prague, much, much earlier, even has a bigger chiddish than Rabbi Yaakov Kamenetsky. And that's the following. Mm -hmm. Let me go back to a Mishnah in the 10th parak of Psachim. Right, Arve Psachim, the 10th parak of uh, Psachim is the parak about all the laws of the Seder. In fact, I would urge people, if you have time, uh, to learn the whole parak would be, you know, difficult. It's a big, complicated parak. But at least do the Mishnayas. If you want to know the basic Talmudic sources for how a Seder is conducted, the Mishnah lays it out. <laughs> including a lot of the text of the Haggadah is taken. Every person must regard himself as if they were taken out of Mitzrayim. That is in the Mishnah. Rabban Gamliel says, anyone that doesn't explain Pesach Matzumara is not Yotze uh, his Chova. That's in the Mishnah. Uh, the Man the uh, Manishtana, with some differences, are in the Mishnah, right? So uh, it's a worthwhile limit with uh, your children, grandchildren, to actually learn the uh, either before Pesach ideally, or during Pesach itself, to learn the Mishnayot of Arve Psachim. But the Mishnah begins with the following rule. Arve Psachim, Samach Mincha. Adjacent to Mincha time, I'll discuss that in a moment, you should not eat. In other words, you don't eat at a certain time of the day, you stop eating, because we don't want to ruin your appetite for the matzah of the Seder. You should eat it with enthusiasm with geschmack, so you shouldn't uh, uh, eat, eat. Now, what is Samach Mincha? So again, Samach Mincha, uh, without getting into all the background, is essentially the last three hours of the day. Meaning to say, uh, from the beginning of the 10th hour, hour 10, 11, 12, the last three hours of the day, you don't eat. I'll, I'll discuss what you don't eat. Now, when I say hours, you understand that we mean halachic hours. Uh, so you have to look at a calendar. We don't mean fixed hours of 60 minutes, but we mean uh, one, you know, an hour is one twelfth of the daylight from sunrise to sunset. So in the winter, for example, a halachic hour could be as, as short as 45 minutes. In the summer, it can be as long as 75 or 80 minutes. Okay, halachic hour which means uh, the last three hours of the day is the last quarter of daylight. Right? Don't eat the last quarter of the day. That's called Samach adjacent to the Mincha time. Now, Tosvos asks the following question. What is it that you're not allowed to eat once you hit that red zone of Samach Mincha? It can't refer to Chametz, because chametz, you already couldn't eat from the morning. After four hours, you can't eat chametz. So that's way gone. It can't be matzah. Matzah is even usher earlier than chametz. You're not allowed to eat matzah. Now, some people don't eat matzah from Purim or Rosh Chodesh. But Meikar Adin, you can't eat matzah from the morning of Erev Pesach. The expression of the Talmud Yerushalmi is, Anyone who eats matzah on Erev Pesach is as if he is having uh, intercourse with his betrothed uh, before the chuppah. Meaning to say, yeah, eventually you'll, you'll get together with your matzah, but now is not the right time. Don't jump the gun. So, Mimanifshach, you can't eat chametz already. You can't eat matzah already. So what's left? Ah, so you say, well, plenty is left eggs and fish and vegetables and meat. Says, but that you're allowed to eat. You actually are allowed to eat non mizonos items. I can eat that till the end of the day. I can have gefilte fish. I can have, uh, I can have um, a hard-boiled egg. I can have whatever. So, the Tysus asks a very simple question. What is it that you're not allowed to eat once you hit samuch la mincha? So Rabbeinu Tam says, this is the Rabbeinu Tam I alluded to before, ah, 
you would be allowed to eat egg matzah until samuch lemincha. Reason? Egg matzah is not chametz. This is what Rabbi Tam says. It's matzah. But it's not within the prohibition of eating matzah on Erev Pesach because the only matzah you're not allowed to eat on Erev Pesach is the type of matzah that you could be yotze at the Seder. And since you cannot be yotze at the Seder with matzah ashira, you can eat it on Erev Pesach until until you reach the level of Samach Lemincha because it may ruin your appetite. So first of all, you see, uh, uh, you see the Rabbeinu Tam would not agree with the Ramah. Rabbeinu Tam is permitting me to eat egg matzah on Erev Pesach after the Zman Chametz. And by that logic, I could eat it on Pesach it's, it's, itself. You see? Uh, so you, see, you very clearly see that Rabbeinu Tam, as well as the Maral, did not agree with the Ramah's Chumrah. Like the Ramah, uh, you would not be allowed to eat egg matzah from, from, from the time you cannot eat bread, four hours in the morning, four uh, halakhic hours, you cannot eat egg matzah. But this is what the, this is what Rabbeinu Tam says. So Rabbeinu Tam says, what is the thing that gets forbidden? Samuch <coughs> lemincha. It's not chametz, because that was forbidden from four hours. It's not matzah because that was forbidden from the morning of Erev Pesach. It's not eggs and meat and cheese and potatoes. That's mutter. So what is left? Matzah ashira, which I could eat the whole day until I hit uh, the samuch lemincha, where we don't want you to ruin your appetite. Now, here is what my Ral says. And this is going to be even a bigger chiddush than Rav Yaakov Kamenetsky. Maral disagrees with the Rabbeinu Tam. Now, Maral, remember, is mekel on matzah shira. Maral actually says matzah shira you can eat during Pesach, like Rabbeinu Tam. But here is what Maral says. Maral says, let's say you're at your Seder <coughs> and you're really messed up. You don't have any matzah for your Seder. The only thing you have is egg matzah. So says the Maral, putting aside Shmura, which I'll get to, putting aside, that's going to be, that's going to be a biggie, but this is a theoretical psak. Says the Maral, Bidiyeved, 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 Bidiyeved. You can even be Yotze at the Seder with Matzah Ashira, without a Bracha. And he says the following reason. Because after the first year, the eating of Matzah at the Seder has two symbols. It's a commemoration of slavery and lechemoni, but it's also a reminder of the haste by which we left Mitzrayim. And similar to what Rav Yaakov's argument was, that even though matzah ashira is not connected to lechemoni, but it can still commemorate the haste because it didn't rise. So if a mitzvah is supposed to have two symbols and you're only makayim one symbol, better to do one than nothing. And therefore, Rav Yaakov's argument is, and not Rav Yaakov, the Maral's argument is. See, Rav Yaakov's argument was simply, I can use Matzah Ashira for the rest of the week. Maharal's Chiddush is much bigger. There is an Indian of eating Matzah Ashira even at the Seder, if you don't have any choice. Because the Lohispik B'tseikam Lahachmitz still applies even in Matzah Ashira. Therefore, here's what Maral says. On one hand, this is a tremendous leniency. That you know, the Eved, I should eat this. On the other hand, it'll lead to a Chumrah. He therefore says, if Matzah Ashira can be a partial fulfillment of Matzah, it will be us, sir, to eat it on Erev Pesach. Because remember, Rabbeinu Tam's Hanacha was, Rabbeinu Tam's Yisod was, that since you're not Yotze with it, you can eat it at Erev Pesach. Maral says, since you are Yotze with it, you can't eat it at Erev Pesach. <laughs> so, we actually, so whatever your leniency is for the Seder will be your Chumrah on Erev Pesach. Therefore, Maral says, we're back to square one in terms of Samuch Lemincha. What are you not allowed to eat? Samuch Lemincha. It can't be Chameitz. You're already forbidden for four hours. It can't be matzah. You're forbidden from the morning of Erev Pesach. It can't be matzah ashira because that's going to be nichlal 
in the prohibition of matzah? So Maral learns a Balabatashe answer. It says, oh yeah, and it can't be fish and eggs and cheese and all that stuff because you're allowed to have it. You are allowed to have it. Answer is, very push it. Yeah, you're allowed to have it, but don't stuff yourself. So when it says, lo yochal, lo yochal doesn't have to mean don't eat anything, but it means don't overeat. So enachinami, what is that you shouldn't overeat on the potatoes, the eggs, the fish, the meat, whatever it would be. Lo yochal means lo yamale kreso, and in a uh, there is nothing new that gets totally interdicted, meaning the total interdictions of chametz, matzah, and matzah, that's already come into being. Samach lemincha, there's nothing that you're totally prohibited in, that you're not already prohibited in, but lo yamale kreso, do not fill your, your stomach. So, uh, very, very uh, fascinating. So, Rav Yaakov's Chiddush was, Matzah Ashira is a Kiyom Mitzvah for the rest of Pesach. The Maral suggests that B'dyevet, it might even be a Kiyom for the Seder itself, although you would not make a, a Bracha. As I say, none of this works with the Ramah, for Ashkenazim, who Bichlal Asers, but uh, if you follow, again, the Maral himself and Rabbeinu Tam, they are both presupposing that Egg Matzah is okay. Yeah. No, you know that's certainly you know that absolutely is certainly possible, and, and and it probably is even optimal and superior. We're talking about you know be the evidence. If I don't have the other one, is there some concept of second best? So really, we're, we've been analyzing second best ways of doing things. I think you're correct. Optimally, you should incorporate both. Both ideas, yeah. yeah. I was wondering if there's any significance to Chomets. It seems more, even more important than Matzah. Uh, yeah, so yeah. So, so sacrifices as well. Yeah. So one one thing you need to know about Chomets is that although we we clearly associate Chomets with Pesach. Remember that uh, there are prohibitions of chametz that are way, way beyond Pesach. The Beis HaMikdash, for example, the Avaida of the Beis HaMikdash was largely a chametz-free zone. The Korban Mincha that was brought was not allowed to be chametz, except on Shavuos is one exception. Um, even the Lechem upon him, you know, you, you think about them as breads, they, they were in fact not chametz, although they were soft. They were soft, like Sephardic matzah. So chametz is really very, very bad even in the whole Avaita, the whole year. And once again, the basic idea, maybe I'll have to save it for, for next week if I think we have one more share, uh, is that chametz represents arrogance, represents gaiva. It represents also inertia because when water hits flour, you don't have to do anything to make it chametz. Uh, uh, it, it happens by itself. You don't need yeast. You don't need a starter. So matzah, you got to do something, but kumbi say to arrest the fermentation by heat. So chametz represents the Yetzir Hara. I'll, I'll just end with one beautiful little thought. You know, for many, many years, I'm not sure if it's still the case, the largest Seder in the world was in Kathmandu, in Nepal. And it was a Chabad Seder, and uh, they had 2,000 people, mo- mainly Israelis, because after people finish the IDF, they love to go to Asia, whatever it is. I mean, yeah, whatever, Israel is too small for them. They want to see the world. So uh, it's a big, huge Seder. And obviously uh, the logistics of a 2,000-person Seder outside is a little difficult. But they have a little bit of an avant-garde ceremony, Erev Pesach, which is very beautiful, I think. Uh, when they burn the chametz, and they have big bonfires burning the chametz, everybody is supposed to write on a piece of paper some bad mida that they wish they could destroy or go beyond. I have an anger problem, I'm selfish, I'm egotism. And they throw it into the fire to be burnt with the chametz. Now, you hear that and you think, ah, oh, avant-garde, hippie, you know. But the truth of the matter is, if you look at the ancient tefillos that were recited when we burnt the chametz, al pi Kabbalah, the mukubalam's tefillah was, just as I was zocha to burn the external physical chametz, May I burn the chametz of my heart that keeps me distant from God. So chametz has a very deep symbolic value uh, of gaiva and arrogance. In fact, I'll just end with one, one quick uh, other story. They say a Rebbe was doing B'dikas chametz with his chasidim, 
And they spent hours and hours and hours and hours, and the Talmidim were very proud of themselves. We really did a great job. But the Rebbe seemed a little agitated. The Rebbe pointed to his chest, his, and he said, And what about the chametz in here? What bedika did I do in here? So the Talmidim gave him a brilliant answer. The first mission in Psachim says, a place that you don't bring in chametz, you don't have to check. <laughs> says, Rebbe, in here, makam she'ein machnisen bo chametz, ein sarach Did you have a question? Yeah. What if you can't eat that? Oh, yeah. All right. So, so again, I, I do have to stop, but let me just point out that the shiurim that are really valid are much, much, much smaller than the shiurim that are commonly advertised. I mean, the shiurim that are commonly advertised in the yeshiva world, you know, two-thirds of a matzah, a whole matzah, uh, really, a, a kezayas is the volume of an olive. So the truth is, if you eat one-sixth of a typical shmur, hand shmur matzah, one-sixth, you vada have a kezayas. And I'm being generous. I, that's already larger. But, but let's say, if you go with one-sixth, you for sure will be okay. Now, that means you have to do it at least three times, though. So you'll eat the total of a half a matzah. One-sixth for motzi matzah, one-sixth for korech, and one-sixth for the afikomen. So altogether, it's a half, half of a shmur matzah, so that hopefully should not be too difficult. Okay, be well, and uh, I think next week we're still on, but, uh, but I will give you an excuse if you feel you can't make it.